welcome to another episode of Meet the Leader, brought to you by the Wongozi Institute. I'm your host, Gomaka Kifukwe. On this program, we're extremely honored and privileged to have His Excellency Jerry Rawlings join us to share his views on leadership and some of the lessons he's learned along his leadership journey. Your Excellency, welcome to the program. Mm, thank you. Now, you're a very storied and well-known head of state from Africa, and you've done a lot for both Ghana and for the continent. And we'll, we'll get to some of that later on, but I want to start right from the beginning. As you reflect on your leadership journey, where did that start and how? I uh, was um, pretty young, around the age of nine, I think, eight or nine. As I sat in a compound one day, and my auntie was uh, whispering to her mother, my grandmother, that she would have to secure a party card before her husband would be paid. Her husband happened to be an Englishman who was building a lot of the estates in a new township. I mean, that she had to secure a, a party card before she can be paid, before they can be paid for the work they've done didn't make sense to me at that age. Plus the fact that she was whispering. You only whisper when you're afraid of your environment, correct? And plus uh, a few other things, you know, in the climate, in the atmosphere. Uh, the young pioneers. Well, not too long. Yeah, we had, no, 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 this was after the age of 10, I think. We had, we had won our independence. I mean, Nkrumah was the leader then. And I have to admit uh, that as the years went by, people became more and more frightened of his government, his party machinery, you know? I mean, he, then, he no doubt meant well, you see what I mean, for his race, for Africa, but um, I don't think his party machinery or people around him became intoxicated and it ended up creating a lot of stress over the years. I mean, his overthrow came as no surprise to me at all. Even at uh, around the age of 15, when I was in school, secondary school, boarding school, one of the minister's children dropped a cake of soap, brand new, as he peeled the, removed the, peel, the cover. And it was a fairly clean bathroom, a common communal bathroom. He refused to pick up the soap. Yes, he went to look for a new cake of the lux soap or whatever, and all kinds of things. You know, you had situations where we, we respect and admire our teachers. When you end up with a situation where uh, teachers that you admire are afraid of students because of who their parents are, it does not go well for the pol political climate at all. So it created a lot of animosity against Nkrumah's um, government. Sure. No, no, no. And, and, and for you, on a, on, a, on a kind of personal, familial note, was there anything in particular about your household or, or the culture that you were raised in that made you kind of sensitive to, you know, a sense of injustice and, and that kind of responsibility and, and equality that clearly seems to be coming through? Was there Very anything good. in particular that... Yeah, 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 yeah. I can cite you another example. When I left school and joined the military academy into flying, the Air Force, after about uh, the three months of hard training, we were all invited individually and interviewed. And uh, I remember there were these two white guys. The question they were asking me was if I could see myself someday and join a drink with my colleagues, fellow uh, cadets. I think I understood what they were saying, but I pretended I didn't. So they asked it again and again. The third time I said, I think I know why they're asking me this question, because they find me snobbish. I snob my colleagues. Yes, I do. And that's because 
where we live, the quarters, the military quarters. Every room has been assigned, uh, what you call it, a batman, like a manservant. And I don't like the way they treat them. My colleagues treat those uh, manservants. And when I look at them, um, it doesn't appear as if any of them grew up in, a, in, a, in homes where they had house helps or servants anyway. You know, and to come here and have this privilege and be treating people this way is something, yes, I, I don't like. And that's why I snubbed them. But the reason is that I grew up in, a, in, in homes where there were servants. But the point is, you have your responsibility. You do your sweeping, you, you lay your own bed, etc. And the servant has his or her responsibility. So in effect, you end up growing up respecting each other and appreciating and behaving like brothers and sisters. You understand? Yeah. And in the process of growing up too, I've worked with laborers during holiday vacations, etc. And I've grown up with people. I did not grow up and allow anything to take me outside the orbit of reasoning, you know, the, the empathy that we must necessarily have for one another. So, <laughs> no, it's interesting you say this because, of course, you had a, a storied career with the military, which we'll come to. Um, but you know, the military is known for breeding leadership. I mean, it's a core part of how leadership or, or how military training progresses. So, in your case, actually, the leadership responsibility was framed outside that. Did you find it difficult to reconcile this with with a kind of military regiment? Or the two quite no 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 we 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 got along. Okay. I mean, when I was uh, at school, also, you know, that boarding school I just talked about, I joined the cadet corps, you know, and I'd always wanted to to fly anyway, and I'd always wanted to join the air force, you know. So for me, the military was next to nature, really. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it it seems you were very popular. In the, in the military, at least amongst your peers, from, from looking from, from the outside. Um, in, in 1979, you led an unsuccessful coup and you were actually arrested and sentenced to death. And then a month later, there was a successful coup and the military kind of rescued you and then progressed to move you to, to lead the kind of transition government. What was it that you think your peers saw in you as, as a leader? That is part of the disinformation because people do not want to, or the media, or those who are opposed to the concept of the fact that humanity has a right to revolt. You will find it in the ethics of man. I don't have to go into that book to, to prove my point. Mm -hmm. But uh, they must necessarily call it a coup all the time. Yeah. 15th May, the, the atmosphere was so charged it was pretty much like what I keep calling, uh, what you call it? Opening the gas in a kitchen and the place is filled up. All you need is just to ignite a match and throw it in. So something was... It, it would blow up. I mean, nobody could have carried out a coup d'etat in those days. Because the command structure had so much lost, what you call it, respect, you know, from the bottom all the way up. Kind of legitimacy. That, correct. It would have been difficult for any officer to undertake a coup. Mm -hmm. the, the atmosphere was just ripe for an explosion. My concern was that if we didn't hurry up as young officers to, to attempt to re rescue it, to arrest the situation, mm -hmm. ahead of, of 79, mm -hmm. the extent of rage would not have reached that depth or that height but we waited too long, and that's why the atmosphere, not just in the military, the whole nation was calling for blood, blood, blood. So you've got to understand that 15 May, I was full of rage too. Yes. And all I had to do was is to ignite it. I didn't need a whole battalion. 12, 10, 12 people is all I had, and we were in a position to do so. But at the last minute, I decided, no, I couldn't, because so many innocents would be killed. Yes, officers, their wives and children, etc. The extent of rage amongst the rank and file was too much. So I decided, no, I wasn't going to ignite it anymore. 
and I asked my, my boys to go to, to have some rest because we were as ready as midnight. Incidentally, the night is a more secure and safer time for people who want to do violence. Yes. The daylight has a restraining effect, naturally. So I thought I'd ask them to get some rest and would start around 3 o'clock in the morning. The new, I changed my mind without letting them know that I changed the plan, was to arrest the armored squadron, the armored vehicles, and demand for a confrontation with the officers, with the generals, you know, that a change must take place, something has to happen. So that would, would use dialogue to make the change. And of course, I knew what I was, the new change, the new plan was kind of risky. And uh, that's what happened. Now, the very thing I was trying to prevent, this explosion, through the action of, incidentally, something I said during the trial was that leave my men alone. I'm prepared to take responsibility for all that's happened. I think he just caught on like wildfire, like they couldn't believe that an officer would want to sacrifice his life for them, etc., etc. So one thing led to another, and uh, I was some general actually signed for my execution, you know, on that Monday. And of course, they type it, the word had gotten around. And the very explosion I was trying to prevent. In other words, that was also not a coup d'etat. It happened, the spontaneous this thing. You know, there's a fellow officer, I don't even know him, who went around, around 3 o'clock in the morning calling out, like, uh, where are they, etc. And couldn't see people come out and shot himself. And I think that is what ignited it, you know. Etc. It's, it's a long story. Got into, so I was released, went to the broadcasting house, made the announcement that I, I needed to do, you know, sort of uh, inviting fellow officers to, not to stand in the way of the ranks, yeah, because they're full of venom. Yeah. And when I say they're full of venom, let me take you through one or two examples under the Achampong regime, the general's regime. The economic situation had become so bad that uh, antibiotics, baby milk, was being sold in markets on tabletops. Yes. And uh, scooping, correct. So you really had the tough That's how bad pressure. it was that uh, hoarding. Yeah. This Makola market women would go into the shops, the major shops, and purchase all the cloth, everything, etc. Baby milk, name it. Even antibiotics would be was being sold on tabletops like you have in a, a market. So you have a situation like that where soldiers, not once, not twice, not three times, would go pleading for a reduction in the price. There was also an escalation of price. And the country had grown to hate us, hate the government, you know. And a poor soldier in uniform, like I said three times, goes to a market to ask for a reduction in the price of cloth for his family. And what do the market women do? They throw urine at him. Yeah. Urine at a soldier in uniform? Well, any human I'm not body. saying <laughs> correct. Taboo. Yeah. Mm -mm. You know? I mean, that's the contempt that they had for the uniform in those days. So at that moment, you can understand how much he would hate that woman, hate his general up there. The no, the officer corps, and we were seen as officers. They didn't see that, you know, there are officers and there are officers, generals and whatnot. Oh, yeah, they would have done as all in. So, you know. so you've really been driven by a sense of, of, well, of, of fairness and justice, but also a loyalty then to, to the state, as it were, the state of Ghana, stabilizing it and so on. Um, you very yes. quickly ceded from yeah. the military to a civilian role, mm -hmm. uh, and that was short-lived. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were brought back in 
and managed to stabilize the country by establishing the Fourth Republic. I wasn't brought back in. Oh. I came back in. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. When we handed over the first time to Le Mans, within, after three months, it was almost as if, I mean, eight generals, including two former heads of state, had been executed. And some of them were innocent people, commanders. But it was best to sacrifice the commanders than to go down the ladder of all the guilty people that the rank and file knew about. You know, it was a very difficult thing. At first, we thought we could sacrifice only two. Ten days later, the tension was built enough. If we didn't let go, they would start collecting. Meanwhile, they had arrested officers in all the units, except for, you know, those within the rank structure that I had named. So, Etc. Etc. Th that period was an expression of rage, mm. but thankfully we managed to contain it within the military, and we paid the price for it, the national prize. And then the handover comes, very swift. You think all that anger and all that rage has dissipated? Of course not. It takes some time. Wait, it'll take time. Etc. You know, etc. But to cut a long story short, there was still a good store of it, with a hope that in giving the power to this new administration, the, 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 the road, you know, of integrity that we had embarked on, the sense of justice, fairness, would be continued, would be an underlying principle. But no, the nonsense did not only start the state security machinery, started arresting and persecuting soldiers in various units and started harassing me. Yeah, they attempted to eliminate me on two occasions. Yes, of course. And they started giving back the courts, started giving back the properties that had been confiscated, ill-acquired properties that had been confiscated, states started giving back. I mean... So you were going back to that situation? Correct, well. correct. Okay. You know, very disrespectful of human sensibility and sensitivity. And, and no sense of a history. Correct, either. correct, Chief. So, this time round, don't forget the first time, mm. the ranks felt mm. that a lot more people should have been executed and we wouldn't have it, I wouldn't have it. Age was bad enough. If... If we don't move in again, mm. It'll get and dangerous. they correct, and they do, it's like we told you, we told you, mm. and it's like they'll complete it. Sure. So I had to take the lead again sure. and accept my leadership from the beginning so that I would, and I immediately converted all that anger into productive energy. And, th and that took a while, and you eventually then took over as a, as a civilian. Leader. Oh, yeah, that took quite a while. But the, our best time was that first 10 years of a revolution. Mm. And I remember, what's his name? And the whole of West Africa was actually uh, getting ready to burn. Yeah, Many governments fell. Go look into it. Yeah. And Nigeria was on the edge of the precipice to fall. Mm. And... Had, and everybody, or most countries, wanted to have it our way. Because up to that point in time, most of us in Africa, West Africa, knew nothing but corrupt governments, one after the other. I remember when the Western powers and the media started talking about, uh, what do you call it? Terrorism, terrorism, etc. I pointed out into their faces that you're now talking about terrorism. When governments in Africa were terrorizing us, the citizenry, I mean, where were you? Some have still not let go of the machinery of terrorism. It's like some of them still believe that's how to rule a people, you know? And along with it goes heavy corruption, you know? It's, it's most unfortunate. But let me get back to the point you were. What were you asking? So, uh, so about this kind of the transition to a civilian government and, and how, uh -huh. whether that was, I mean, it seems it was second nature to you that eventually that was the right way to go. Yeah, I, what I was going to say actually was that uh, the first 10 years of that revolution, when we didn't have the constitution, was our best time. 
It brought the best out of our people. And that's why I was saying, I mean, because it's a revolt. Hmm. And, and mm. you're expressing all of it. Yes, that. yes, yes. So yes, rather yes. than teaching inside, you, know, you use it creatively. Yes, a rejection of authoritarian rule and all the foolishness of the past. So that the people actually owned, took hold of what now belonged to them. In a, in a kind of, I suppose, a cheeky question, was it, is it easier, in your experience, was it easier to rule in that period than it was later on when you now have this constitution that you know, you're, you're trying to build institutions that are democratic and fair. Yes, I understand you. Yes, it is. It was easier then. <laughs> easier then because of the spontaneity of the people. I think a good natured, by nature, if I'll put it that way. So then, to that, and I'll be very honest with you. When we had to introduce multi-party and go you know, constitutional. The West has a way of saying we became democratic after 10 years in 92, 92. We did not become democratic. We introduced constitutional rule from that point. But the democracy started from that point of revolt. Because the people so, then... Correct. I mean, they had never enjoyed so much freedom and creativity and a sense of purpose, a sense of justice for so long. It was beautiful. But... The introduction of that thing was like the old carpet, the old blanket, the old cover was coming back, you know, People where they, to they, be able they would to feel disempowered, correct, etc. So what was happening was, uh, I have to confess here, that State Department, of course, uh, the IMF and the World Bank, don't forget that Western powers had tried for a long time to overthrow us, and it just never worked. That's how come they resorted to having Shagari throw out the million uh, Ghanaians in order to save his regime, because his regime came out of a military situation also, like ours. At the time that Liman, that civilian regime, came in after 79, he also emerged. This man. You know, we've had a revolt, they haven't. You're messing up, so we come back. So Nigerians just wanted it badly also to deal with the, the history of corruption in their country. So that is what endangered Shagaris, and they thought a way out would be to destroy the revolution in Ghana. This is a regional problem and we've dealt with it and therefore things at home kind of calm down, as it were. Oh, they thought, you know, it would. But the nature of the African, as usual, I mean, everybody had a home, everybody, you know, we, we just absorbed them and we just continued. So it endangered his regime because Nigeria wanted to deal with corruption too. This is finally, I mean, coups have attempted it, they've become corrupt, etc. This is probably the first time that somebody has emerged with a solid, what you call, of integrity, known integrity in a very corrupt situation, I mean, as, without a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. So like the people have finally got the chance to get the right person. The right leader. And I'm hoping, as I was saying yesterday, that he would pick the right team yeah. and give Nigeria the leadership that she, she wants, she desires. And, and that would really dy dynamite things, you know, in a positive way. But just to take your step but, back, as you, you had said about under the military period, um, I mean, it's counterintuitive to a lot of people. That is when people enjoyed most of their freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways that says a lot, if I can be frank about it, as you as a leader that ensures, yes, this is a military style and there's no constitution, but people have their freedoms. And I want to kind of segue into a broader point about leadership in Africa. Mm -hmm. There is a sense that leadership on the continent is, is personality driven still, whereas in other parts of the world, leadership, particularly the executive, has become an institution. I mean, is this a fair, is this a fair kind of generalization about Africa and, and about the rest of the world? Or do you think, think again, this is part of, as you were saying, this, this misinformation that I th I it's think used against us as, as no, Africans? No, 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 no. We, we also have a way of contributing to that cult, is what I mean. But I think we, as leaders, when we end up in that situation, must recognize that people will now begin to treat us like semi-gods. And we, 
we should be conscious of the duty bound to prevent it. We must create the kind of chemistry that would make people tell it to us as they should. You, you see what I mean? Fairly and firmly, you know, and respectfully. But uh, this is uh, at the very best. Then, of course, you have those who actually come with criminal intent. <laughs> it's a very harsh, strong word. But who um, are so materialistic that they actually go out to destroy institutions of integrity in order to survive. And this is what happened after I left office, you know? But let me ask you, I mean, you, you, you respected the two-term limit, and, and you left office in 2000, actually to, to an opposition party, as I understand it. Mm. Um, and you decided to respect that, so, you know, thereby giving that kind of institutional legitimacy. Correct. Can you actually stop being a leader? Is, is that something that's possible? Not necessarily as a head of state, but you still lead, you still have influence. Correct, is correct. That, is that something you're able to, correct. to do? And, and that's why I'm saying people ask, uh, people have the tendency of saying, suggesting that uh, I had all the power and I could have stayed on, you know. And I tell them, no, 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 I couldn't have. I would have been defied by the people. The institutions do exist in some of most of our countries, but the human factor, you know, lacks the confidence. The intimidation from the machinery, the posting away, you know, judges, etc., to outlandish places, etc. You intimidate and everybody then kowtows to, you know, the central political authority, which is not good enough. And that is not part of our culture as Africans, in our native tribe of what you call it. I mean, we, we do have respect for one another. But that's the point I was also making, that in inheriting the English language, and I'm saying that you should have used that language, those collection of words, you know, to express the culture of your integrity or the integrity of your culture. But no, we also allowed it, you know, to be contained, and we use the, the language as a weapon of intimidation in governance. That's what can sentence you, that's what does this, etc., etc., etc. Let me just cite one little example of something that happened one time when I f came into office the very second time and uh, soldiers were misbehaving all over the place. Soldiers from my unit, you know, went and provoked something or the other and there was likely, I mean, it, it created tension and there could have been an attack the following day. And I was thinking, I mean, what can I do to prevent this thing in a very genuine way? I thought about it and realized the solution was right there. So I called some of the senior warrant officers and said, go and see your counterparts in the other unit and indicate to them you're coming to see them at 5 o'clock, 5.30 the following morning. That was all. That was all. Tension began to dissipate because in our culture, you know, when something serious, genuine, spiritual has to be dealt with, you call the children, the parents call the children, or whoever they are, the elders, wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30, sit and deliberate on the issue. And resolve it. And resolve it. Because it's seen as a very genuine, serious situation. You understand? So I'm saying by the following morning, the tension had dissipated. So you lean on that kind of cultural... Correct. And too often, we put it outside, put it away, lock it away, and just continue this way, in this, uh, what do you call it, superficial manner. And this is why I'm saying that I appreciate, I respect Nigerians a lot more in this respect. They've not, a, the, your lady, what's her name? The MC, she is smart, huh? brilliant. I mean, she is, uh, these are the kind of people, uh, they are role models, and she's perceptive, a wealth of information. In some parts, in some political areas, we bury people like that. We, we suppress it. We don't allow them to shine, to be role models. And that's part of uh, the problem we have. There was a lady who talked about Chinua Chebi. She's very right. I read Chinua Chebi as well. I was at school, and how impressed I was, and I read the other one, what's it called? Another one was written by, along the same lines, was written by Ayikweyama, a Ghanaian. Ayikweyama's book, 
had the title, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. Yes, very famous book. As I grew up, and I was seeing so much brilliance, so much integrity, you know, like all the people at this conference yesterday, as I was beginning to notice people like that in my country, in those trying, corrupt times, that's when I realized that, no, 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 no. The beautiful ones are born, they are there. It's just that the political climate is not allowing them the opportunity to shine and to provide leadership. That's it. So I didn't feel intimidated by, you know, having to take over at all. Because the people to lead us and to provide whatever to help us are there. I suppose yeah, the same for, for leaving office. You knew that there were people there. Uh, correct, correct. You know, and that, that kind of brilliance is, excuse me, is created by, this is brain power. This is, uh, their self-esteem is in their ability, their brain power, their intelligence, etc. It's not through the show of materialism. Mm -hmm. you, you, you understand? Yeah. And, uh, and, and they're there. We should, we should use them, you know, to provide the necessary leadership, okay? So I think a good leader must be able to recognize those with the leadership potentials and bring them up. Get them out. And get them out, them. you know, sure. to provide the leadership. Sure. And, and after leaving office in, in Ghana, you've served in, in multiple positions and, and uh, in roles at the Pan-African level through the Pan-African Parliament, with the AU, and so on. Do you find that different? Is it, do you have a kind of a, a tension between balancing Ghanaian interests versus African interests? Are these the same to you? Is there a difference in, in, in the way you have to approach problems? No, 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 no. I think uh, human beings are human beings, Charlie. We all have the same aspirations, you know. You just have to identify, recognize, you know, what is peculiar you know, to them in any one particular place or the other. That's the word, understanding, you know. Understanding their situation is half the work that needs to be done. But if I may comment on one aspect of the Somalia situation, the only complex thing I found about it was that one, they were I, I had to withdraw, I had to draw back, okay? Because I couldn't stay there. And I couldn't stay there with them in Somalia. And I didn't think this was the kind of thing you would handle from outside, based in Kenya or Ethiopia. I thought you needed to be there. But uh, the deployment of the number of tanks and soldiers, you know, to ensure my security was too much. It was not conducive. It, to correct, they, they needed to, to uh, fight Al-Shabaab or whatever, mm -hmm. to bring some, some, some sense of order and not be around me constantly. And the other side of it was, uh, you don't send me into a situation like that and don't give me executive authority to, to give orders you know, to, to troops on the ground. Yeah, it's very difficult uh -huh. for you to implement them. What it, it, correct, is what I mean. And that's what, and one side would be taking advantage of a situation like that, you know. You couldn't get things done appropriately, you know. Uh, I thought it would be best for the commanders in chief themselves, for the heads of state to actually deal with the political authorities on the ground and the military situation. Yes. How old are you? 13. 30. One of the Scandinavian prime ministers was shot and killed as he left, I don't know whether it was a, a movie theater and was going home. And that's because any time the, the cloud, you know, of the apartheid situation was going to die down, Palmer would reignite it. Any time he would die down, he would reignite it. And, you know, he paid the price for it. I'm trying to say that um, the world became engaged with Mandela with a 
collapse of the bipolar world, changes that are happening globally, we're now left with two areas of some serious callous injustice, apartheid South Africa and the old Palestinian case. Apartheid South Africa is free, Mandela is out. Why are we still seeing the sin, the sin of the Palestinian persecution? It's the failure to mobilize for that. Crime. And I'm saying that, you know, that kind of situation is affecting the psyche of humanity. Yeah. And if we cannot deal with that kind of injustice, it will continue to percolate down and spark little pockets of injustice in places. Yeah. We need to restore the greenhouse cover of political, international political morality. It'll take the energy out of uh, fanatism because part of it is directly related to the manner in which these Palestinians are being treated. It's unconscionable. And the silence of Africa shocks me, you know. And that's why I was saying that, you know, let us not keep dreaming of peace, the kind of peace, the unique kind of peace and stability. After all, they're Muslims. The unique kind of peace and stability we're, we're asking for. It wouldn't happen if we're not heard voicing. Even if nothing happens about it, we ought to be heard voicing, you know, our, our rejection of that kind of situation. But, but if I can take you back to, to, to an earlier question, just as a, because it was the second part of it. As a, as a former head of state, you're remarkably candid and very open and outspoken. And this is quite unusual, particularly for, for African former heads of state. I mean, can you kind of glean us or tell us why that might be? Is there anything different about you, or is it that the situation doesn't allow for this? I don't know. I mean, this is the way I've always been since I was a kid. This is my freedom. You know, I used to say that I didn't go out to want to be a president or a head of state. It was my pursuit of justice that put me in the seat of the presidency, you know. So coming off it is not, has not changed me in any way. Move not when the circumstances right. I can see are still unjust. So those just, that I, I can speak about, I will. Those that I can do something about, I will attempt to. Yeah. And then just in kind of in, in, in wrapping up the, the interview as well, I just want to hear a little bit about you know, Jerry Rawlings, the individual, you know, the husband, the father. How do you balance this with this persistent pursuit of justice and high office? I mean, how, to put it very bluntly, how do you relax? <laughs> how do you unwind? How do you... You know, how do you attend to those other things that people tend to overlook in leaders that, you know, you're a human being too? It's difficult to relax, you know, in this kind of situation. You know, the beauty of our situation when I left office, the economic and the social gradient, the pyramid, was very shallow. You know, the authority gradient but uh, it's become very steep now. Guamaca, before the collapse of the bipolar world, President Nyerere was passing through my country, I think to refuel, when I met him at the airport. And as we were walking from the aircraft to the lounge, he was asking me, what are we going to do with the imminent collapse of the Eastern Bloc? You know, because their socialist policies, you know, served as a counterbalance of a sort to the capitalist, whatever it is. I couldn't answer him because we really couldn't tell the way the world was going to be like. And, uh, but I ventured a little suggestion that, uh, well, the capitalists are Christians and they've been touting the values and the culture of democracy and that's supposed to be at the core of their struggle, their fight. You know, so maybe the world might turn out to be a better place. The very Pope John Paul, 
who contributed to the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, have several years later indicted the economic practices of the world with the words, the savagery, in his pastoral letter, the savagery of capitalism. That should tell you what, what became of the world after the collapse of the bipolar world. Yeah. Nepotism, the, the privatization of power, both economic and political, has been the order of the day. So, and further down, several years later, what did President Carter also say? He indicted America, he reproached America and said, uh, you've lost your moral stature. And in a way, this is why the world was so expectant. This is why Mandela became such a powerful figure after him. Uh, the, the world, America, found, what's his name, Obama. And he suddenly looked like a man of, uh, with political morality. And the world was so expectant of his leadership, really. Because what had happened earlier was just too much. Incidentally, in case you never saw this, and I'm saying it as a reminder, many years ago, Dick Cheney, who became Bush's, Junior Bush's uh, uh, vice president, used to be the minister for defense. You know what he said on CNN? That America's interests supersedes, overrides issues of morality. I saw it. I said, my God. That may be the case, but to mouth it this way and we'll teach our enemies to fear us and blah, 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 blah. I felt very sad, very sad. But that has been the reality. Obama did his bit to hold it in check with the practices of some of these multinational entities and corporations, but the point is that it has assumed a life of its own in the rest of the world. And Africa with its weak situation, vulnerable situation, weak institutions has become the most vulnerable place, you know? And we get up and we, yeah, of course, the media is doing its job, portraying all kinds of little activities going on. Africa's on the rise, etc. Of course, we can see all these buildings, all these structures, etc. But I'm saying that it looks like we're being assimilated, you know, in the name of investment and these private entities. You know, uh, we will continue to hold the short end of the stick for for some time. Can we unchain ourselves? Can we get out of that grip, that hold, you know? It'll take people like Kunkapa. Solid integrity and not materialistic, if you see what I mean. That is something that we've always respected about your country, uh, uh, Tanzania, under the leadership of President Nyerere. You've not allowed money, the monetization, of your democracy, of your electoral process. But I believe you're in danger of having that now, like the rest of us. And that's not healthy, because you end up with a situation, right or wrong becomes politicized, as my daughter said a few weeks ago. Just the two kind of final questions. Yes. You, you've mentioned Mandela, Nyerere, and Carter. Mm. You know, to a lot of us, these are you know, heroes and, and figures that we look up to as leaders. Were there any leaders that you did or do still kind of look up to who influenced you? Or is it more just, you know, you believe in something and you're gonna go and see what happens? I believe in something and I'll move on it. But as a, as a young boy, my brother was 10 years older than me. So he worked in the resettlement sites. They were, with that same English guy I was talking about, they were building resettlement sites before the creation of the dam. And so during holidays, I would go with him into various parts of the country. And I mean, that's where I saw another, uh, other living conditions, apart from those of us, what we're going through in the cities, you know, the poverty. And that's what put me in direct contact with laborers, people. I mean, 
where you're looking at somebody who's about 54 years old or 50 something years old and yet when you look at his card he's written 24 all of them 24 years 24 20 because they don't want to be sent home or being too old you know and at an age of 13 14 15 you, you begin to think you know so this sort of took me around the country to see things for myself what kind of um, advice would you give to aspiring and, and future leaders on the continent as a kind of way, way to end the, the interview? Do you have any thoughts to share on this? When I joined the Air Force, I was then with a communication squadron, and this also took me around the country, and landing on airstrips all over the country, all over the place. And it brought me into contact with the naked poverty people were going through, the, the hardships the brown water people were drinking. Later when I came into office, you know, I said something that shocked our people a bit, but I thought it was necessary because we needed to get water across, basic water, clean water to people. And I said, you know, the, the water we used to flush our urine in the toilets is cleaner than what people are drinking in the rural areas. This can't happen, this cannot go on, you know, no electricity, etc. So sometimes we would take off from a little town and the rest of the place would be in complete darkness. Meanwhile, I know there are towns, you know, villages all over. It became too clear and yet that's where the wealth was coming from, the cocoa, etc. The, the capitals, our towns, were nothing more than parasitic entities. So I'm saying that these experiences were stimulating things in my head, were stimulating things in my head, that uh, this injustice is just not good enough. You know, you're watching people aging ahead of their time. There was a time, I love, I, I love water. Most weekends, I would go to the riverside and stay there as a young officer, sometimes, yeah, with my wife also and uh, our first daughter, just as a way of escaping from the stress and the pain in the towns, in the city. You know, that period I was talking about, the urine time. One day, I would go diving for oysters with the villagers, and we used, uh, yeah, you just use your breath, so that way it gave the oysters a chance to also multiply and grow. But, uh, when we got to the other end of the bank, I was, uh, I was using some white guy's uh, boat and uh, sort of towed one of the villagers' uh, canoe across the river. When we got to the place, you know, he spoke harshly to his, to his wife. So I said, look, could you, you, don't, you don't talk to her that way, your wife this way. You know, be, be a little more respectful. And then he's, oh, 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 what was he saying? That uh, that's not my wife, that's my mother. You know, alcohol and hardship to fend for his family had aged this man so badly. Needle and thread, I mean, all his daughters who would come diving with us, you know, they only had just that one piece of cloth, and that's what they'd have to hope it dries up in time for them to cover up in the night. Jesus Christ, man. So here you are trying to avoid, you know, these kind of scenes, and I come to run into another one. One day I was coming from his place, and there were two people on a canoe also diving for oysters, and a strapping, healthy-looking young man with his back to me had a rope around his waist, and the woman across did not. So I was saying, you know, how come the, the woman's uh, diving without a rope around her waist and, and you have a rope around your waist. When the lady across, you know, said, because uh, the young man, the man had his back to me, the lady said, ah, that's my son, he's blind. A blind guy, you know, had learned how to swim and put a rope around his neck. Many years later, you know, when I came back, I went looking for them. The woman had died years ago and the young man had died because he got caught up in one of the, the, the weeds. One of them can be pretty tight, got caught up in there. But 
you don't run into blind people doing things like that. That's a little risky, you know. But a blind man, you know, was, had learned how to fend for himself to survive. You know, we should talk about the issue of blind men someday, and I'll tell you how Stevie Wonder landed <laughs> a plane without assistance. No, I'd, I'd love to hear this story, but we are, unfortunately, on, at the very end. So just one final word, just in terms of the future and, and aspiring leaders in Africa, do you have any ad advice for them based on, on your experience in leadership? I think so long as uh, the vision, the noble objective, is there and you can identify some of the best in your country to constitute a team around you. What then becomes important is to stay dedicated to your principle, the maintenance of your integrity. Don't compromise on it. If you can do that, I think uh, we'll go a long way. Thank you very much, and I think with those words, we'll, we'll end the interview. So I just want to thank you again for participating and for your candor and to say to the audience, thank you for joining us and for, well, hopefully see you again on another episode of Meet the Leader. Goodbye. Thank you.